Hi guys, it's Kim Lachelle and I go to a lot of Arthur events and I have been dying to share some footage from one of those events and I've decided to share the Arthur Suspense Night that I went to and it had a panel of five, five, five people and the moderator was Reed Farrell Collin along with Megan Abbott, Marsha Clark, Ridley Pearson and Tom, here's his last name. I'm sorry, I don't know it. I, I want to say Shrek, but it's not Shrek. But anyway, Tom, I apologize if you're watching I this. I went back on the footage. I left out a lot of stuff. So guys, just bear with me of what I have to show you. And as I start taping other events and recording different things, I'll get better. Here's a little sum sum that I want to share with you. And it starts off with Marsha Clark talking about her book that's coming out this month. So stay tuned and listen. I have a book coming out July 8th. It's called The Competition. This particular book really is ripped from the headlines. Um, I heard it said best by someone a couple months ago. We write about what scares us. And that really does motivate so much of why, all of us. And for me, I started writing this book um, a year and a half ago, and I was just captivated by the thought of Columbine and the kids that wind up becoming these kinds of shooters. And I had studied psychopaths and sociopathy as a DA and, and sat with many shrinkers. Wait a minute, did she just say shrinkers? I should call them shrinkers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the secret's out. <laughs> they know I call them that. Anyway, I want to get into this. I want to understand. I had children in school myself and was scared about that. And, you know, thank goodness now they're in college. But even that, we know, is not necessarily right. So in an effort to understand it, I thought, I've got to write about this. And I really, it was one of these things that I just had to do it. And I did it. And I finished the manuscript. Um, I wrote about school shooters. And, and in this book, Rachel and Bailey actually consult with two shrinkers uh, throughout the whole thing, talking about how to profile these guys, because they had to catch them. These guys are on the run. So I go into a great deal of discussion that is heavily researched about who they are, why they are, how do they come about, why do we have these psychopaths, how do they you know, how does all, all of this happen, um, and what to do about it. So I finished the manuscript before Sandy Hook, and then Sandy Hook happened. And I thought, I, I don't know if I should finish this book. I don't know if I should do the editing, the rewrites, and go forward with it, you know. And then, you know, my agent um, said, go ahead, you know, do it. No, you have to do it. This is your passion. You, you believe in this, and, and do it. So I did. Um, and then after that, all hell broke loose, as you saw. There was Sandy Hook, there was all of these recent shootings. I don't know what's going on here, but it seems like every time I turn on the television, it's again in Oregon, in Seattle, in California. I mean, it's craziness. So, uh, you know, it, it's one of these sadly timely books. It's called The Competition. It comes out July 8th. Marsha does bring up a good point. It's just too many shootings going on. But I am going to pick up her book, Competition, because I have all of her Rachel Knight series books. So, um, this next section, you're going to hear Reed Farrell Collin talking to Megan Abbott about her transition from period pieces to more current setting. So, you wrote how many period, like two or three period piece four. books, four period piece books, and then you started writing, you switched your focus and write more contemporary books. Not necessarily, well, the fever's kind of set yeah. right now, but um, the end of everything was set vaguely in the 70s or the 80s. So how did you make that leap? How, you know, why did you make that leap? How did you make that leap, and are you happy you made that leap? Yeah, um, people often think it's strategic, you know, somehow, <laughs> the, and I've never made a strategic career decision, ever. <laughs> um, it's always really random, but um, I, I, I love 1930s, 40s, and 50s, especially L.A. I, I, I grew up watching film noir and, and uh, the classic gangster movies and Golden Age Hollywood, and I started writing because of James Elroy. And so I, I love doing that. But at a certain point, after the fourth one, I realized that... I really enjoyed hearing Megan say this. It was just so comfortable. It was like putting on your old old tennis shoes, and I, I wasn't sort of taking any chances or any risks. And so I felt like I had to do the thing I was afraid to do. I had never written about now 
and the suburbs where I grew up because to me uh, writing was to to have a fantasy. It was to be in 1938 Hollywood. Um, and so I realized I was, you know, that that would be the challenge for me to, to sort of, you know, turn, you know, the, the suburbs now into a place of a fantasy for myself to make it to try to bring some magic and darkness and complication and of course what, what we all know is the suburbs are filled with secrets and and lies and deceit Not and here. horrors except for this one uh, uh, so it turned out to work really well and I, and I start, found myself drawing on my own childhood memories of the, the sort of mysteries of the suburbs and the way that families operate and protect themselves and, and that's why this, the case with in the fever so interested me because it's a, it's a town, it's a suburb that feels under siege because they don't know what's happening and you know it, it, everyone wants to sort of protect themselves. So it, it happened organically. That thank goodness, um, or or it would have killed my career. <laughs> so. <laughs> I did pick up Fever by Megan Abbott, and I sent Derby to one of my friends. There was a question posed if the authors write exclusively for a living. Here's Ridley Pearson answering so that. Oh, Ridley, I, I take it you write exclusively, right? Or? I, well, I am I am a husband and a dad. That's my yes. biggest job. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> and then somewhere way below that, I'm currently writing three books. Right. One I, is due, I thought there was something about Amway. Right? <laughs> <laughs> One is due August 15th, and the other two are due September 1st. So right. but, I basically should be home until uh, but, <laughs> but you did read how three or four years ago was it? You spent the year in China? Is that, uh, yeah, yeah. Can you, can you give ago, us right. a. Hear how the Wrist Agent series started. Uh, right. Uh, that started talk. the Risk Agent series. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I had this opportunity. Um, our second daughter is adopted from China, and uh, Marcel and I wanted to give her a chance to see her country, and we ran over there and um, actually rented a house for a year and secured our kids' um, education for a year and then found out you need something called a visa, which it turns out is not a credit card. <laughs> And, uh, this was a shock to us, and uh, UMSL, the University of Missouri-St. Louis, came to our rescue. That's my alma mater! And uh, made some calls and booked me as a speaker at Fudan University. I was going to speak for, I was going to give three one-hour lectures, and for that they were going to give me a residential visa, which would have kept our family in China for a year without getting having to keep leaving and coming back and leaving and coming back. So I was just thrilled. Marcel and I were delighted. We went. This next part was unbelievable. I couldn't believe what I was hearing, but hear how Ridley got played. The Chinese do all their big business over dinner. So we had something like a 14 course dinner that took two or three hours. And at the end of it, we finally could start talking business. And the guy said, you know, I understand you're going to do some speaking for us. And I said, oh, I, I would just, I'd love to. And this is the problem of being an American. Because the next thing out of my mouth was, and you know, if you should need a substitute teacher or anything like that, I'd, I'd be happy to fill in some. And I, this is, I am not making this up. Marcel was there to see it. He pulls a contract out of his chat and says, you will start teaching September 4th. Um, we have a 17 week first semester. You'll get four weeks off at the holiday. And you'll, speak se you'll teach 17 more weeks until late June. And thank you very much for helping out. And I had four weeks to devise a course to teach creative writing in English to Chinese students at the university level. Uh, but when I got home, my agent at Writer's House, uh, where, where Megan's also represented, said, couldn't you find a novel set in Shanghai? And I said, oh man, I could find nine. And I wrote The Risk Agent and, and off we went. There was a question asked about each author's educational background, and I found this to be fascinating and was surprised. level, I went to Brooklyn College. I was on the eight-year plan. Uh, I majored in philosophy, psychology, and English literature, and I never graduated. I, I need to say I have enough credits, three, I'm three credits short of graduation, but people have 
don't, you know, they let me teach college, so I guess I did something right. <laughs> Megan? Oh, um, I, I have a PhD. I don't know how it happened. I just never left school. I couldn't leave. Um, I, I wrote my dissertation on hard-boiled fiction from the 30s and 40s, and that's where I discovered and fell in love with Raymond Chandler, and that's what I wrote my dissertation on. So, And that's how I came to write crime fiction. And, it, and that is actually our first that's conversation. How we, that's how we became was friends. about Raymond, Raymond Chandler. Chandler. And I, we've still never stopped talking about him, so. Um, I have a Juris Doctor. That's all. <laughs> what is there to say? I didn't mean to be a lawyer. I, it was not my intention. It wasn't a grand plan or anything. Actually, my grand plan when I was a kid was to be a writer. So I wound up in law school because I graduated with a degree in poli-sci, majoring in um, international relations. I wanted to work in the foreign office. I specialized in the Middle East. and. You know, I graduated like you know with good grades and stuff, and I, I applied to the State Department, and I spoke three languages, and I thought that was cool, and they said, "Can you type?" <laughs> so I had to find something else to do, and it became the law. High school. <laughs> uh, I, my I went to Kansas University for a semester, and my dear friend from high school with whom I had written a bunch of songs, got cancer, and asked me to come live with him and his family while he went through treatment. And he made it through treatment, and we decided to continue to play music in the event he didn't make it much farther than that, and he's still alive. Um, but I didn't get back to college. I, I went to Brown University for a while, I never got a degree, and it's one of the great, great regrets of my life. It's something that haunts me, not every day, but Often every week. Yeah, right. so, and if you only had that college degree, think yes. where you're going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Great right, folks, you know, the beard uh, doesn't have a degree. So. <laughs> I, on the other hand, uh, I, I, I went to uh, I have a psychology degree from the University of Notre Dame. I have a, a master's in psychology. I'm a credentialed addictions counselor. Uh, I have a certificate in rational emotive therapy and a certificate in hospital administration. Wow. Have you ever read the big book? <laughs> yes, I have. Last chapter of the big book was written by my dad. My dad was Bob P. and he ran AA for 15 years. He's dead now. Get out. Yeah. Oh. I have great, great uh, wow. empathy with anybody in addiction work. This video is turning out to be so long, so I have to end this, and I'm going to end this with a question that Marsha Clark answered about the judicial system. And it was fascinating because I learned something that I want to share with all of you all. A short explanation of the kinds of things that come under the right of appeal and how you might win an appeal. We very seldom win, <laughs> just so you know, um, and that's kind of comforting, isn't it? I mean, and, and that's as it should be. But what happens is you get convicted, then somebody like me reads the transcript to see, did the judge make a mistake in evidence that they let in? Did the judge make a mistake in evidence that they kept out? Did the lawyer make a mistake in not arguing something? Did that kind of thing. Or did the judge, this is the most common one, make a mistake in sentencing? In California, the sentencing laws are so complex. They're, in, they're, they're incredible. And then they keep changing them, and they keep reforming them, and then it gets even harder. So that's the kind of thing that we look at. So that is the basis of an appeal. If I find no significant error, that means an, it's not just any error. Every trial has an error. It has to be an error that makes a difference. If it doesn't make a difference, I file a brief that's called a Wendy brief, which means there are no issues here. And then the court reviews it independently, and that's the system in California. So. It's not, when people say they're going to have an appeal, the defendant thinks it means he's going to get his new trial, he's going to get out of jail. No, that's not what happens. 99% <laughs> of the time. That was fascinating because that's exactly what I thought. They get a new trial, but that's not the case. So I hope you enjoyed the video. I had a lot of fun at this event and I did purchase books. I had never purchased anything by Reed Farrell. So I got his book. So I got his book, Gunfire, Gun Church. This is a standalone. So I was excited to read something by him. I also picked up Marshall Clark's books. This one I have on Kindle, 
already. Actually, I have all of her books on Kindle, but I did want her to sign this one. So I went on and purchased this book also, Guilt by Association. And I said earlier that I picked up Fever by Megan Abbott. And I picked up this book by Tom. And I hadn't planned on picking up this book. But when I heard him speak, and he was so funny, and you might not have seen it in the footage, but he was hilarious. I just had to pick up a book to support him. And I didn't get any... Um, Ridley Pearson books only because the next week he was going to be um, an event just with him in it and I had planned on attending and actually purchasing books then I ended up not attending the event so therefore I didn't get any of his books but he's from St. Louis so I know I'll see him again soon if not this year definitely next year so if you want to see more videos like this let me know comment um, below let me know and I'll be glad to share my experiences with you because they are priceless these events are priceless and I enjoy every single one of them. So thanks for watching. See you later. Bye.